Hi, I'm Cameron Copeland, PhD candidate at Southern Cross University. I'm studying how our soil biology can improve our agricultural systems. One of my supervisors is Dr. Lucas Van Sweeten, a senior principal research scientist at New South Wales DPI, also an adjunct professor at Southern Cross University. Lucas is an expert when it comes to soil carbon and biochar. We're here on his property in the beautiful Northern Rivers. We're here to see how he imparts his soil science knowledge into his operation. Let's go see what he's up to. Hey Lucas, how you going? Hey Cam, how are you? So Lucas, you bought the property back in 2015. Yep. Uh, you did some soil tests. What, what were you looking for and, and what were the sort of results that you found and why, and why you picked this property in particular? Yeah, no, good question Cam. We uh, actually started looking for a, for a farm back in about 2012 and we would have had a look at maybe 30 properties in the Northern Rivers and uh, a lot of our interest in the properties is getting the right, the right piece of land and by that you know we're after aspect, we're after amenities and we're after soil obviously and uh, we were very interested in getting soil that is um, ideal for, uh, for high value horticulture. So you said you had interest in the soil, so what kind of soil tests did you perform and, and what did you find out? Yeah, so we, we looked at about 30 properties and took cores from all 30 properties and had them analysed. That was over a three year period, but uh, when we got to this property, we were particularly interested because when the soil tests came back, they had about nearly 10% organic carbon content in them. So they were very, very deep ferrosols, um, lots of iron in these soils, very well structured and uh, lots of organic carbon. And that means with that high organic carbon, there's lots of mineralisation happening with that carbon turning over and lots of nutrients stored as well. So uh, that means that nitrogen fertiliser, for example, can naturally be supplied through some of those mineralisation processes that are driven by soil biology. So you've got your soil results, um, but why here? Yeah, so a few aspects there. Clearly the soil played an important role, but also the topography. So what we're, we're on the top of a hill here, and that means that uh, we get lots of, lots of air movement. And uh, with some of these high value horticultural crops, air movement is very important for lowering disease, in particular fungal disease. And being on a hill uh, means that we get a lot more breezes from the north and from the south, and uh, we can naturally control some of these fungal diseases. And so you mentioned that you've got, you've retained a little bit of the, the grazing uh, aspect of, of the operation, and then you've added in the horticultural section. How do you go about uh, approaching both systems at, at once? Yeah, so we've got custard apples and the figs, which are our horticultural crops, and we've got uh, some cattle which, uh, which graze the remainder of the property. Uh, the custard apples are our, our primary um, source of farm income and we've got 1,200 trees here which, uh, which are, are now at a stage of producing uh, fairly well uh, but we expect that pro production to increase over the next five to ten years. And having that sort of diverse um, uh, production or income, does that help you in terms of different times of the seasons, uh, like economic decisions around your farm, uh, or that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So the custard apples um, produce, uh, well we halve the custard apples between about April and October and the figs get harvested generally in January and February. So yeah, we've got that year round income, having the two horticultural enterprises and the cattle are basically there in the background and we can, uh, we can buy and sell um, according to rainfall and pasture production. And from an input point of view, you've got the different um, productions. Is it a ubiquitous um, approach? So your amendments and inputs are right across your property or do you segregate them based yeah. on what you have? Yeah. So certainly the, the ferrosols, while they're a brilliant soil type, do definitely have some constraints. And some of those constraints include uh, acidification. And most of the red soils do tend to be a little bit acid, uh, which means that aluminium can become toxic. And it also means that phosphorus, for example, can start binding up. And while we've got lots of phosphorus in the soil, the plant av available phosphorus is actually quite low. So some of the things that we're uh, implementing across a farm include a, a liming regime, whereby we're trying to bring the pH up to sort of the optimal six to six and a half. And we've pretty well achieved that now in the orchard and we're still working on some of the pastures to, to raise that pH to that optimal level. The approaches that you take with, uh, you said the liming or, or your soil amendments, are they something that growers in the Northern Rivers um, can uh, use themselves or is it sort of a niche particular to the topography that you have here on the, on the property? Yeah, so certainly most of the subtropical soils tend to be uh, acidic in nature and I think liming to optimise the pH is a very important aspect for all farmers. The other, um, 
The other constraint that we tend to have in our soils is there's actually not a lot of available calcium and some of the amendments that we're doing to increase the calcium and the plant available calcium in the orchard include uh, application of gypsum. So while gypsum is often applied uh, as a clay breaker, uh, it is probably the most um, valuable source of plant available calcium that we can put into soil and uh, we're using that as a, uh, as a mechanism to boost the plant uptake of calcium. These inputs that you are talking about, have you noticed a change in the property from when you bought it to, to now? Yes, yeah, certainly when we bought the property and it was a grazing property, uh, there were quite a few weeds in the pastures, a lot of fireweed. Uh, we started um, uh, controlling those fireweeds manually, um, but also with the application of lime to increase the pasture production. And that natural competition, that ground cover, uh, has made a big impact on, on weeds at the property. And uh, as we'll see soon, uh, you know, the, it's pretty much weed free. There's still yeah, the odd, odd weed, but uh, nothing compared to when we purchased it. Your decisions around um, how you approach your, I guess, your different productions, is it more economic bottom line, or are you looking to create um, a high performing soil and a more sustainable soil? So I think to create a high performing soil, probably um, loads the budget up front, but I think over the long term you get rewarded for it. And you know, the key things that we're aiming to do is have year round ground cover, uh, minimise over grazing, and that's an absolute uh, must in our books. So if we need to destock during very, very dry conditions, we can. And we can also irrigate. So we do have uh, a 10 megalitre licence uh, with a bore that we can, um, can irrigate the pastures and obviously the, um, the custard apples with as well. So yeah, having that, um, that economic uh, outlay up front uh, certainly mitigates risk uh, in the future. So Lucas, you mentioned that we have a, a ferrosol on the property. Why don't we take a look? Let's do it. As you can see, Cameron, we've got lots of uh, lots of ground cover, and I think that's the key to having uh, having healthy soil year-round ground cover. Uh, we minimise bare soil, and we've got lots of roots going through the through the soil, you know, down to 10, 20 centimetres from the from the ground cover. As you can see, the soil is very well structured. It's quite soft and friable, which means that there's no physical constraints. But one of the things, I guess, with the with the ferrosols is they they tend to have very very high infiltration. So when it rains, water can drain through the soil very quickly and this area has got very high rainfall so 1600 millimetres per year mainly summer dominated which means that it's quite important to have that good uh, good flow of water through the system. So these ferrocells typically we find them to be red in colour this is more of a, a, an off brown yep. why do you think that is? Yeah this sort of chocolate brown colour is uh, due to the organic carbon in the soil again that 10% organic carbon inherently brings that, uh, that brown colour to the ferrocells uh, if we were to burn that carbon off, they'll turn more red with the iron and aluminium mineralogy. Other than, say, the, um, the draining uh, aspect of a ferrosol, are there any benefits um, to uh, the production system that you've got here? Yeah, so, so these soils are, are very low bulk density. They're, they're only about uh, bulk density 1 to 1.05, uh, which means that uh, it's very easy for the root systems to penetrate the soil. There's no physical constraints. Um, the soils, again, have got uh, some constraints due to low pH, so they do tend to acidify. And with that acidification, when you get pH below about 5.5, aluminium toxicity, toxicity does start to, um, start to come to the fore. And at pH 4.5, uh, it can become quite problematic. So having a, a, having a good liming regime, understanding the soil, understanding some of the key properties of, of the soil, like pH at a minimum, uh, and organic carbon content really will allow you to better manage that soil for productivity. Would you say ground cover and inputs um, are processes that growers right across the region can approach in terms of improving their soil quality? Yeah, absolutely. So for the orchards, um, you know, we use a range of inputs including lime to increase the pH, gypsum to increase the available calcium, and also some uh, compost application to help supply some of the nutrients, in particular nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and sulphur that both the microbes and the trees need for, uh, for good health. Now we've just turned over about 10 centimetres of soil which is considered topsoil. Yep. What would you find a bit further down in, in the bulk soil? Yeah, this soil is actually quite deep. We've got about uh, four to five metres worth of ferrosol before we start hitting, uh, hitting clay layers or rock. So yeah, we're very lucky here. It's a very, very deep soil. 
and again very few physical constraints to uh, root penetration and that means that the, the tree roots can actually access water and nutrient at depth whereas often when you get uh, get soil constraints or shallow soil you're limited to that topsoil whereas uh, these trees don't have that limitation. Do your pastures enjoy the same benefits as the ferrosol yeah. as your horticulture crop? Absolutely and the roots from the kaiku you can go down meters to access uh, access soil moisture and you'll often see that in uh, in some of the ferrosols on the surrounding floodplain soils for example the grass is often um, dried out and browned off whereas on the on the ferrosols because you get that deep root penetration um, the pastures are often still looking quite green. So we've got a quite extensive list of benefits of ferrosols. Uh, are there any negatives or downsides to a ferrosol soil? Yes, there definitely are. As with any soil type, you know, they need to be well managed, I think, to get the optimal performance. So again, getting the pH right, getting the nutrient balance right, and maximising ground cover to avoid erosion are really important. So while these soils are very well structured, they don't disperse, they're not sodic. Um, you know, they're still prone to, to water erosion if you get surface movement of water uh, and also wind erosion. That's why ground cover like we've got here uh, is essential for keeping the soil and also the inputs like compost in place. Now with your role as a senior principal research scientist at New South Wales DPI you've had a little bit to do with biochar. Let's talk a little bit about that. What are its benefits um, to uh, an operation like this? Yeah so we've actually got a trial uh, in this orchard with biochar and also some uh, biological amendments. Uh, and certainly the, um, the benefits potentially of biochar include uh, its value as a liming agent, uh, it's the fact that it can be a very, very stable form of carbon, and it can also help to increase the cation exchange capacity of the soil. That means it holds onto the um, cations like calcium and potassium and magnesium and makes them plant available over time. Stabilising carbon. Growers hear this time and time again. What is it and why is it important? Yep. So soil organic carbon uh, is basically any uh, material that, uh, that once lived that's now decomposed down into the various soil organic carbon pools. And those pools could be carbon that are protected by minerals. And in this soil, the minerals will be iron and aluminium in particular, and the clay is associated with those. Uh, it could be larger particles of, of soil carbon. And we can see some, some root material there. And, and as that root material breaks down, and that will help form some of that soil organic carbon pool. And we've also got the charcoal carbon pool, uh, which might be millennia and uh, thousands of years old, sorry. And, um, and that charcoal carbon uh, would originally have come from bushfires in particular, uh, but more recently, um, we've got the options to add that charcoal carbon into soil via the use of biochar. So a major constraint with ferrosols uh, is phosphorus deficiency. How would you overcome this? Yeah, so while these soils actually contain a lot of phosphorus, uh, that phosphorus is bound to the minerals, in particular the iron and the aluminium, which means that plants can't actually access that phosphorus. Some of the ways to increase the, the phosphorus availability in these soils include increasing the pH. So you know, bringing the pH up to six or six and a half definitely increases the, the phosphorus availability. Um, we, can, we can look at organic amendments like compost, for example, that contain mineralizable phosphorus. And we can also use uh, synthetic phosphorus fertiliser like uh, superphosphate if we need to. Now all this information about these uh, amendments and mitigation processes, where does this come from? Are they experiments um, on farms? Are they in labs, glass houses? Where, where do you get this information from? Yeah, um, good question Cameron. It's really a hundred, hundred years worth of, of knowledge from the science community. And I think we've got a very good understanding of you know, the chemistry uh, of these ferrosols. And, and what makes makes the chemistry um, suitable for crop production. What we don't understand very well is the soil biology. So I think there's still a lot of opportunities to better understand and utilise uh, the biology of the system. Utilising biology, is it more of a way of manipulating the biology to uh, behave in a way we want to, or is it a way to maybe select the right crops and the right soil types to work with the biology that's already there? Yeah, so my preferred method is to use a biology that's already there and basically feed the biology that's already in the soil. And the way to do that is to have continual input. So while we've got ground cover here, uh, this ground cover is photosynthesizing, it's grabbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, it's turning into sugars, it's turning into uh, organic acids, it's feeding the microbes. So at each of these root interfaces, you know, there's, there's a, a whole host of microbial activity. 
and the plants are basically feeding the biology. And what we're trying to encourage is the biology through um, that, that, that ground cover. And in particular, where you've got mixed species ground covers. So I'm a big advocate of mixed species pastures. And here underneath our custard apple trees, you know, I like to have a mixed species ground cover. And so there are national trials going around that sort of thing. Should growers um, test for their soil microbes? That's a very good question, Cam. I think it's still a challenging area um, to understand exactly what the soil biology tests mean. Uh, I know the Soil CRC, the Cooperative Research Centre for High Performance Soils, has got some projects on understanding what these metrics actually mean. So while there are a whole host of tests out there, uh, it's still challenging to decipher and to understand uh, what the relevance and the consequence of the different soil biology means and hopefully you know, in the next few years we might start getting a better understanding of that. Mm -hmm.